Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 99th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. You guys are in for a treat. This is part two of my discussion with Dr. Bernardo Kastrup. Last week, we talked about the philosophy of idealism, and this week, we talked about some of the most fundamental ideas I can conceive of, which is kind of rationality itself, and specifically rationality in relation to psychedelic drugs. So there's a lot of people in my investigations that I've come across who claim that you can experience something beyond rationality, something beyond logic. And it's not necessarily internally contradictory, it's just not a-logical or non-logical. And I've never had that experience, so it's very hard for me to try to wrap my head around it and understand what's being spoken about. And usually when talking to these people, I must say I'm not persuaded. I find that there's always a, some kind of a logical, rational context in which you can make sense of their experiences on drugs. But Dr. Kastrup is, is obviously of such a clear rationalist disposition and has very sophisticated arguments that you can't just dismiss when somebody like Dr. Castro comes along and says, hey, maybe there's this other type of existing or being which is beyond mind and illogical and you can't put it into words. Uh, and so naturally, uh, we had a conversation about it and it was spectacular. Uh, really, the, both part one and part two are some of my favorite conversations I've had with anybody on the show. And it's interesting. I feel like I'm, I'm talking to somebody who's experienced something that I kind of accept that I can't grasp because I haven't had the experience. I, I see I'm, I'm not going to be able to get it maybe until I, I try my hand at psychedelics eventually. Um, but nonetheless, it's still a fascinating conversation. And uh, if... Any of you have been following my work or you read my short book uh, on logic, it's called Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge. Um, I, place a, I place logic on the highest pedestal. I think it's literally metaphysically inescapable, the laws of identity and non-contradiction. And I even claim that I'm certain about it. It must be that logic and existence are inseparable. That is the thesis of my book. That's the fundamentals of my worldview and everything. I'm, the worldview I'm building is built on the assumption and here comes Bernardo, uh, I don't know if challenging the assumption is, is correct, but maybe saying that that assumption is incomplete and maybe there's something more than that. A conversation kind of mimics a multi-millennia long conversation that's been happening in philosophy about the role of theory versus the role of experience in trying to get at the real nature of the world. Is it the case that theory has the final say, or is it the case that experience has the final say? I think historically speaking, experience has trumped theory. And I think that's because people's theories are way, way, way too dogmatic. And as we talk about at the beginning of this uh, interview, what consistently happens throughout history is that there's a orthodox theory that's uh, ossified and people believe it's definitely true in the way the world works. Then there's some experiences that are outside of the theory. and Everybody says those experiences are impossible. Or somebody comes along with a new theory, like uh, uh, Newton's theories of physics. And they say, this is magic. This is nonsense and superstition. This is impossible because we know the truth because of our theories. And then given enough time, people realize, oh, these ideas or experiences that we thought were magic and superstition turned out to be pretty good and maybe better than the existing paradigm. So... 99% of cases, I side with experience, but I admit there's three <laughs> theoretical assumptions that I just can't shake. It's just the laws of identity and non-contradiction and this relationship between logic and existence. I can't conceive that those are incorrect. And so that's why this conversation is so valuable um, for me, and I'm sure it will be for listeners of this show. You can find my guest's work at bernardocastro.com. I will have a link to his dissertation and uh, some of his books and his website at the show notes page this week, which is steve-patterson.com slash 99. I still am of the, the rationalistic mentality where I don't see... I don't see logic having to be revised 
I should say, definitely not the law of identity and non-contradiction. The excluded middle can get into like the philosophy of language. And what does it mean to say the present king of France is bald? Does that have ontological import? So I, I agree. And there's some interesting history here with the philosophy of mathematics, as I know you know. Um, but I don't think there's any reason that these things can't be like perfectly understood in the context of our own reason. I just think people are really, 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 really bad at reasoning, and they're not, they're not being honest with themselves. I, mean, I have to start methodologically with what I know, and I have to, that means I, mean, I have to start with my experience and my consciousness. I think that's the most rational thing to do. Oh, there's a lot to comment here. Uh, <laughs> let me just make a, 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 it's not where I want to get, but I just want to, to say uh, quickly one thing. Magic was never a taboo in science or physicalism. Science has embraced magic since its inception. When Newton proposed uh, the law of gravitation, that uh, two <laughs> bodies would attract each other at a distance without any contact or, or any necessarily medium in between, between, that was magic. And actually, the French stuck to the opinion that this was magic and ridiculous for decades after Newton proposed it. So. It's not magic anymore once we review our unexamined assumptions, so to say. Once we review them and we get habituated to something, our right. sense of plausibility changes. And then it's not magic anymore. It's just a postulate about something that is inherent and fundamental in nature. Right. But that postulate keeps changing. I mean, there was mm -hmm. a time we thought that, uh, uh, um, uh, that a stick would attract shaft when it's... Uh, electrostatically charged, uh, that, 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 that that attraction would be because an invisible medium, an elastic medium, would connect the shaft to the thing that attracts it, like a comb, mm. uh, and, and that elastic medium would pull the shaft. <laughs> uh, and, and that was accepted theory mm -hmm. for a long time uh, in the Middle Ages. It was very reasonable. It was accepted for all the same reasons that we accept multiverse cosmologists today. Uh, 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 Kuhn wrote about it in the, um, uh, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions in 1969, I believe. Uh, he, he explained, oh, this magic was never a taboo in science. What is taboo in science is meaning. The moment you say there is a meaning to say, oh, no, not, now you're out of the club. You right. just signed, you know, you just signed your excommunication certificate. You are out of here. Yeah. Meaning is not acceptable. That is the unexamined major prejudice in science. It is this, this prejudice against meaning. I mean, I'm not saying that there should be meaning. I don't know. Right. I have no fucking clue whether there is meaning. I suspect there is. I think there is. But I don't know that there is. Um, but I'm open to it. I find it entirely plausible yeah. that there could be meaning to life. Such a complex universe that seems to have generated us with so much labor and so much difficulty. Yeah. I find it eminently plausible that there might be a meaning behind it all. Right. But that is a no-go area in science. Yeah. Not magic, it's meaning. So, so I just want to piggyback on this, a thought experiment, right? You, so put, you know, we're in, the, we're in the, the mindset of of modern scientists. And the only thing we're describing is the operation of the physical phenomena, physical machinery. And then somebody comes along for the first time and posits consciousness. So you'd be like, yeah, there, that is the most absurd. That literally is a cat. It's a, like two category mistakes. What do you, that doesn't literally does not make sense within yeah. the concept of physicalism. And it's like, okay, that might be true, but it's a given that this is, yeah. it, that's actually the world in which we live. Yeah. So, so continue. Uh, we, we are trying to reduce consciousness to an abstraction of consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> we are chasing our tails at light speed, hoping we will catch it at some point. We will never, we will never reduce consciousness to a conceptual, conceptual abstraction of consciousness. In other words, matter. But anyway, yeah. back to logic. Um, I, I live in the world of rationalism. It's what I do every day is finding rational, you know, well-constructed, tight, logical arguments for the positions I put forward. I do it because that's the ethos of our civilization today. That's what counts today. Nothing else counts. Nothing else will make a social or cultural difference. 
um, which is our social and cultural prejudice today. While in science, the prejudice is against meaning, at the cultural level, the prejudice is against anything that is irrational. Not necessarily irrational, not necessarily uh, contradicting logic, but something that transcends logic. Mm. Um, the logic as, we, as was defined by Aristotle <laughs> in, in classical Greece, because there are many types of logic. There is intuitionistic logic, there are many types. Um, and very good reasons to choose some other ones uh, sometimes. But anyway, that's our prejudice today. So these are the constraints I chose to operate in, because I agree with you when you said one of our key problems today is that we, we, we are using bad reasoning. <laughs> So even if you grant that logic is fundamentally correct and it's the foundation of reality, it precedes the laws of physics themselves. We, we can accept when science makes an advance and says, oh, you know what? There, there is no magical gravitational attraction at the distance mm -hmm. between two bodies. Mm -hmm. It's just some kind of fold in space-time, you know, some distortion in the fabric of space-time. Well, then the magic becomes space-time and how it can be distorted, <laughs> but n never mind. Uh, we accept that, but we don't accept the illogical. Mm -hmm. So I accept that constraint. Otherwise, I would not be heard, man. <laughs> I would not sell a single book. And, and I agree with you that we can do a lot better within that constraint. I think even granted that constraint, we are arriving at all the wrong conclusions within logic. It's yeah, all agree. the wrong conclusions. I agree, I agree, and, methodologically, right? Because people are starting with the theory rather than starting with the experience, yeah. which is a, a fundamental methodological exactly. mistake. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and so given the constraints of logic, I think we can do a much better job. So my personal attitude is, I'm fighting this battle, how much better we can do within logic. I'm not going to fight the battle of, uh, but should we really stick to logic? Mm -hmm. I think we shouldn't. And I wrote one little book about it <laughs> called Meaning in Absurdity, uh, which is, I think, my poorest selling book. <laughs> it's, I don't know, maybe it crossed a couple of thousand now, but it's been out for years. Um, so I'm fighting only this battle how to do logic correctly yeah. and arrive at the proper conclusions within logic. But I'm not married to logic at all. I think we are, as human beings, we are born with many other mental faculties, feeling, intuition, um, uh, some forms of insight that do not require linear, linear uh, uh, steps of reasoning. So, so let me ask you a question then on the definition of logic, because one I think I use a, a somewhat non-standard definition and that I don't necessarily mean kind of the bridges between claims in, in arguments in so much as I mean, this is almost a metaphysical principle that things are the way that they are. The law of identity, the law of non-contradiction are metaphysical in nature. Like, like there, there are no, there cannot be contradictions, real contradictions in, in reality. Do, do you agree with that? Well, yes, because it's by definition so. I you agree. define contradiction as that which cannot be the case. Well, so if you say, well, it cannot be the case that there are contradictions, and say, sure, and that's how it's been defined. Well, but but there are some people who would disagree with that. They they actually had a conversation once on the on my show with an academic teaching at Columbia, who was trying to give examples of metaphysical contradictions, and he said, Take yeah, but those are linguistic examples usually. Oh well, it I, it was yes. He was he was talking about the Pope. He says the Pope married. Well, he's married and not married at the same time. I was thinking. Jesus, not the best contradiction I've ever heard. But I, I don't necessarily mean we're. So I, I, I would say this as a principle. Whatever is, is exactly the way that it is. Yeah. And it's not the way that it is not. Sure. By definition. Yeah. Well, but, but by definition makes it sound like a linguistic thing. I'm saying by, by like metaphysical necessity that there cannot be something that is some way that it is not. Well, physically, it's complicated because what you're appealing to is definiteness. And, and quantum mechanics has thrown definiteness out of the window for a hundred years. So it, it, it gets complex if you, you know what I mean? If you really want to go to what is out there and you say, well, the state of the world is definite. Whatever it is, it is what it is and it's not what it's not. Yeah. 
quantum mechanics doesn't seem to agree with this. Well, uh, well, but that's not quite true. So there are many different interpretations of quantum mechanics, of course, as you know. Um, some of them are more definite than others. But I, but I think that even if one wants to say things are in a superposition of being this way and that, I think the idea is that this is not a logical contradiction. Actually, I think there's a metaphysical... There are definitely some interpreta in interpretations of the Copenhagen interpretation in which I think you get logical contradictions, but I think that's a mistake. I, I don't think... Yeah. I, I would say I if there's any metaphysics that is definitely wrong, it would be one that is internally contradictory, especially because there are other alternative theories which aren't contradictory. This is a very rich territory or yes. a very deep quagmire, depending on how you want to look at it. I mean, there have been papers about yeah. well, is logic empirical or not. There was a discussion, I think, with um, – there is even a book about it. There were two papers, um, famous papers on this subject in which people were – I think it was Quine – that was uh, looking into quantum mechanics and trying to figure out, well, is logic empirical? If it is, we have to get rid of the, 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 um, the theorem of exclu excluded middle and so forth. So it's, it's a rich area. I don't think mm. we will I agree. make I agree. sense of it uh, here. But uh, what I would say is this. Usually when people say that a contradiction exists, usually what they mean is there is a sense in which something is a – and yes. another sense yes. in which something is the negation of A, Agreed. not A. Uh, they don't mean that it's A and not A. Right. It, there is a sense in which it's A, and there is a sense in which it's not A. Particularly psychologists, this yeah. is what they do. Yeah, yeah. When psychologists say, well, you know, there are contradictions, this is what they mean. There is one sense, it's one thing. There is another sense, it's another thing. And usually yeah. we, we cannot define these senses very well. It's sort of a bit fuzzy yep. in our heads, yep. and then and then we pronounce a contradiction, but it's not a true contradiction. Right. And linguistically, you can create true contradictions. This statement is false. Well, if it's true, it's false. But if it's false, it cannot be true. Well, then this statement is false is a true contradiction. It's both true and false. Well, but it, uh, uh, maybe that's one interpretation. That, that would be the dialetheist interpretation that it is actually true and false at the same time. But there are other attempts, I think successful attempts at resolving the liar's paradox and saying there's, there's li linguistic errors uh, at play where it, 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 it's not true and false. But even if this is a problem, yeah. suppose these linguistic paradoxes were a problem. Well, I, I actually think, I tend to think they are a problem. Uh, but it sort of emerges from a semantic schema as, uh, that, that we created ourselves. Um, I think it, this translates or can get projected onto the world at large insofar as the world at large is a story we tell ourselves mm. in language. Yeah. Um, because uh, when we talk about the world at, lar at large, we are not talking about sense pixels, bundles of sense data, as Kant put it. Uh, we overlay uh, a narrative on it. We split it into objects, into certain relationships between objects. You know, we apply syntactic, syntactics and semantics to it. And, uh, and then we replace sense data with a narrative. That's how human cognition works. Psychologists have known this already for a few decades now. We don't see the world as it is. It, it, you know, we overlay a narrative on it. And then if linguistic uh, contradictions truly exist, then we are overlaying those contradictions. <laughs> Into the, onto the world insofar as the world is that narrative we create. Right. You see where I'm going right. with this? Right, but in terms, uh, of like the under, in terms of the mind, uh, the, the universal experience, in every way that it is, it is only in the way that it is. And there is, it is no way in which it isn't, right? So there's not, there's, it couldn't be some way that it definitely isn't. Because if it I, were some uh, other way, it would be that way and not another way, right? In terms of definitions, you're obviously correct, but I, I'm I still mean, resisting I, I mean the moving beyond. I, I mean, yeah, the yeah, I, I know what you're. Like, I know what you're saying. So you think that yeah. there could be an experience of a type that is not how it is? I think there is a lot more going on here than we suppose within the constraints of our rationality. Yeah, and a lot of it is filtered out as a natural cognitive mechanism because it cannot be accommodated within our internal narrative. So it's not that it could be this way and that way, like a plurality of ways, it's that literally in the sense that it is some way, 
It is not that way. <laughs> By insisting on, on, on framing the problem as you are framing, which okay. I can completely relate to. <laughs> yeah. But by, by your very insisting on the, this framing of the problem, you are already acquiescing to human rationality. That is do you true. understand? Do, do you see what I mean? Yes. I, I guess I have a hard time grasping anything else. Because I, I feel like to say, to put the only constraints on the universe being like, it is the way that it is, is still pretty generous. I mean, you can have all kinds of remarkable things, all kinds of experiences, even if we take the idealist approach, all kinds of textured and nuanced experiences. But I really have no way of, of understanding what it, what it would even mean to say that something could be the way that it is and not the way that it is at the same time. It can't if you frame the problem as you are framing. Well, how's the other way to do it? What do you... <laughs> Yeah. This framing of a problem is, 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 is a dynamics in your rationality. Uh, you see, uh, I, 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 I can completely relate, relate to the difficulty of making, because now we are asking mind to abstract away from its own boundaries, and, and it's very difficult to do that. You can only do that if you have a experiential reference beyond those boundaries. Um, and that experiential reference is not something that you can come to through steps of reasoning. Ah, okay. It's, it, 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 you either have had it or you haven't had it, if you know what I mean. And so, only with this, this Archimedean point outside reason can you, can you understand what I mean when I say that your very framing of the problem already incurs in the very thing whose no. validity we are questioning. Well, and this is why I find the within the rationality paradigm so compelling is because I think it's inescapable. It's a thing like a, as soon as anything is said, you're within this paradigm. Yeah. And I haven't yeah. had the experience of anything outside of it. I've had the remarkable experience of falling in love with my wife was the most amazing experience I ever had. Totally logical though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, I think this is a very sophisticated problem we are discussing now. I think the moment we get as a culture, as a society, to the point where this becomes the problem that needs to be discussed, that will mean that we will have already solved so many problems that are still <laughs> ahead of us, that I will be so happy the moment the discussion we are having now would become the key discussion yeah. to have at a cultural level. I think we are way behind it. I think there's a lot of, a lot more basic stuff that needs to be sorted, uh, a lot more things that need to be seen for the foolishness they are within the boundaries yeah. of logic and rationality. I completely agree. So the moment, the moment we sort our house of reason and we put it in good order and we eliminate the insanities that, uh, that still reign supreme uh, in our culture today, then we can have this discussion. I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, but you and I are sensing something here, and I think there are more people who are sensing it. It's not part of our collective consciousness. It's not part of the cultural debate. It's something that we didn't create language yet to capture in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that does justice to it. We, we don't have the conceptual arsenal to, to corral it in, in, in statements, if you know what I mean. Well, so... So you have this experience, and I've had lots of conversations with people who have this type of experience, but I haven't. So I totally grant that there are experiences like this that people ha happen that happen to people, and they report them. But I kind of view it as you've seen a color that I haven't, and it's uh, I'm very curious about this. It's like you, you're an astronaut and you've been to a, pl a planet that I haven't. I can't even, I don't even know where it is. I've never even seen it on the map. But I, I do want to ask you just a couple of questions on this. I know I, I appreciate you being so generous with your time. Um, this is really enjoyable, though. Um, now I'm having fun, too. Okay. So, so on that, though, when you, so you've had this experience that you say, let's say it's outside of the general parameters of logic as we normally conceive of them. So, so now looking in on the logical paradigm, you see that as being flawed or limited? No, uh, yeah, limited, incomplete, yeah. So, so within the system, though, it still is correct. It's just that it, it's, not an in, 
it's not an entire metaphysics, maybe? There's a, a type Correct. of existence outside of it. Yes, it's an internally coherent system that uh, is very useful and correct for everything that is amenable to it. But not everything is amenable to being framed according to that system. What isn't, though? I mean, <laughs> I, know you, I know language is not going to... I get that, but you have to understand my curiosity here. It's like, well... <laughs> <laughs> mm. I have a friend... Uh, um, because, you see, uh, I, I, I've made a conscious choice to fight the fight of reason. Yeah. And not any other fight. Right. But there is a, there is a side of my life that is not governed uh, by reason. It's become increasingly a smaller, smaller part of my life as you know, all the balls in the air that I'm trying to keep now sort of grab my, my skills and channel them all into reasoning. Uh, but there is another side to my life. And, and, and this friend of mine uh, relates to me only insofar as that other side of my life goes. Mm -hmm. He can't relate to all the reasoning side of my mm -hmm. life. And he, I think I can name him, Rupert Spira. Uh, he's a non-duality mm -hmm. um, uh, teacher. Um, and he watched my PhD defense. <laughs> and uh, he didn't say quite like that, but I'm sure that by watching that, it, it's on, on YouTube, probably his thought was, how torturous <laughs> and difficult these guys make what is obvious, <laughs> what is immediately obvious to unprejudiced experience and contemplation. So that gives you a sense of, you know, if I'm talking to him, it's a completely different discussion. Then uh, we start from a different set of uh, references, uh, mutually acknowledged oh, starting points, okay. so to say. So let me ask you, so this is, so I think a lot, a lot about the law of identity. Is it the case that what you're describing is some type of existence or, or experience in which the law of identity doesn't apply to anything because there aren't things? So it's like, yeah, A would still be A, but there isn't any A. Yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to follow you down this road, but the moment I do that, I acknowledge the framing of the situation in a way that I cannot acknowledge because it would defeat the very point in contention. It's something you knew when you were a kid and before you knew how to speak. It was the reality you knew. It was all you had. It was what was given to you before you replaced the world with a logical narrative. But I don't have before, a memory of it because when I think back of my... No, no, you, you do have that memory. Oh, you cannot ordinarily access it. Okay. Uh, but if one day you do, you know, oh, fuck, I always knew this. I have always known this. I've never forgotten. It was there at a subliminal level that I couldn't access by just indexing and saying, okay, now I'm going to retrieve those contents. No, 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 that's not how it goes. But it was always there, obfuscated by your ordinary life. But it was always there. It never went just right under your nose. It's closer to you than you can imagine. It's so, so close to you that you can't see it. How, how do you see it? Then? Is, is this, I mean, obviously, psychedelics are one way to do it. Is there another way that people can see the thing well, that's I, right there? Uh, spiritual paths never worked for me. Not that I really tried seriously because I was I never had the I don't know the disposition the, the character it, um, it can happen spontaneously it has happened to me spontaneously a couple of times actually maybe more than a couple of times but it it's very elusive it's like um, trying to remember a dream just after you wake up and it escapes through your fingers. You, you just remember that you did remember the dream, but you no longer remember the dream. You know what I mean? <laughs> you remember that you remembered it when you woke right. up, but five seconds later, that's all you remember, that you did remember, but you no longer do. Yeah. Uh, and so it's slippery and elusive. It's, um, uh, somebody put it in a way, th this is not from me, and I, don't I, I can't attribute it correctly, so I regret it, but I will say it anyway. Uh, I don't know who said oh. It was my friend Deepak Chopra who said that. <laughs> um, he said, it's what 
in between two thoughts. It's the gap between two thoughts. That's what it is. Um, and I think he pinned it down. I mean, people criticize him a lot for, for what they claim is word salads, you know, incomprehensible jumbos of things. You know, uh, there is a difference between something that is truly incom incomprehensible because it makes no sense and something that simply you don't comprehend. Right. And uh, I think his critics tend to mix these two things. The fact that they can't comprehend it, that they can't relate to it, right. uh, uh, doesn't mean that it's a word salad. But that, this is uh, the boat that I'm in because I think, okay, between two thoughts. All it's right. the I, in the space between two thoughts, you will find it. But I do that and I go, okay, it's just... Experience. No, but you see, if you say, now I'm going to do it, well, it's gone. The okay. moment you do that, it's gone. You can catch it. Do you take naps in the afternoon? Yeah, when I can. So you can catch it when you're about to fall asleep in an afternoon nap or just after you wake up from an afternoon nap. In that space when you're not asleep but you're not quite awake, you can catch it there. Isn't it but just consciousness, though? It just seems no. like a state of consciousness. Everything is a state of consciousness. It There's just, nothing that it is seems not like a, a state logical of state of consciousness. It just seems to be another moment. If you apply your th reasoning to it, you will miss it by definition. Um, uh, now, I, I, I may sound like I'm talking complete nonsense here, which, of course, it is. It is nonsense because it is not sense. Uh, that's, the, that's the very point. Um, and, it, and it's not my mission, you know, it's not what I propose myself to do. I'm not the guy who is going to teach you to meditate and, you know, find these subliminal states of mind and, you know, try to wrap your hands around something that is so elusive that, you know, if you try to grab it, it just slips between you. I'm not the guy who is going to go down that path. I'm the guy who is going to argue on the basis of parsimony, logic, and empiric empirical adequacy that physicalism is bullshit right. and that we need a better ontology to guide our culture. Um, but I will not deny that, um, that uh, these other things are also part of my life. I wrote one book about it that was ignored, <laughs> that solemnly well, ignored. <laughs> I'm definitely going to have to get a copy of that book because th this is so interesting because I, I wrote a little book as well on, uh, I suppose, on the topic from the opposite direction where, where the, the kind of the thesis of the book is that logic and existence are inseparable and, and it has to be that way and it literally couldn't be any other way. So the, and, and I claim certainty about it too. So this is, this is uh, this puzzle that I, what I found is in, in talking with people about these types of experiences, pretty much without exception, it can all be still within the parameters of the law of identity. It, experience is however it was, and it wasn't how it wasn't. But maybe that's a framing mistake. So my, my no, curiosity look, is piqued. If I go now this, down this path with, the, with you of thinking about it, I completely concur with you. It's inevitable to concur with you. If I think about it, if I reason about it, I will concur with you. Uh, and it's a met I mean, that book I wrote is already a compromise because I try to undermine the system from within. So I, I still frame the problem according to reason. And I try to undermine reason from within, like Godot undermined uh, um, mathematical logic from within by using, you know, theorems and all that formulation. So that's what I tried to do in the book. So it's already a compromise from the get-go, uh, because something that is not a compromise can't be written. It can only be caught in the act, uh, and it's very elusive. Um, you can't induce it. You can only train yourself to pay attention when it happens. And trust me, it, it happens every day. Um, but we have very selective memories. Uh, we usually only remember what we tell ourselves about what we are experiencing, not the experience itself. If you don't tell yourself what's going on, you don't remember it. Uh, memory is so attached to this metacognitive capacity, to this narrative making reflective capacity. So it, it, what you don't remember, you might as well have never experienced because you never caught it in, 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 in the fishing net uh, uh, of experience um, because it's a 
high fil highly filtered uh, fishing net. It only catches the big fish, but the minnows just go through. And you think the minnows are never there. They are there. So you can only train yourself to pay attention. Um, or for some people it works. It did work with me years ago. <laughs> Take high dose psychedelics, and, uh, and it's it's right there, and it's, it's on your face. And See, when you it scares me though, this because because I'm I'm so much of the rationalist disposition, and I know you can identify with this. When I look at it from the outside, I go, well, I don't want to go crazy. Like it sounds like, well, oh okay, no, there's don't irrational. worry about it. No, 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 no need to worry about. It. Two days after your trip, you will dismiss it. <laughs> well, that's... two days after your trip, you say, oh, that was a bunch of nonsense. And then you, you talk to somebody else and who will ask you, what about psychedelics? And you say, yeah, it's a nice trip, but it's bullshit. You will dismiss it. You will forget it. Um, and it will no longer be part of your life. Two, it's 48 part of hours. It's part of yours, though. <laughs> it, for a long time, it was not part of my life, despite mind-boggling psychedelic experiences. What I'm telling you is what happened to me. And how did I get out from this? I began to, it was a time of my life I was tripping more or less frequently, not for the sake of tripping, but I, I, I saw it as, a, as a, an investigation. Mm -hmm. It was a research project. Yeah. And I was very serious about it. Uh, before I started, I did all kinds of health checks to make sure that my heart, my liver were okay. And I studied all the literature, you know, and I, I'm very methodical about it. Um, and I would have mind-boggling trips, and I would dismiss two days later. And then three months on, I would do it again, and I would think, oh, how we, what an idiot I was having dismissed it previous time. I missed something, I forgot something, but now I know that there is this, this ineffable thing that I can't talk about, it's there. And then 48 hours later, ah, oh, no, 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 it's not really there, you know, because, you know, the more time passes, the more perspective I get. Uh -huh. So it's more reliable what I think now than what I thought 12 hours after the trip, because now I have perspective, right. I, have, I have hindsight, so let's forget about that. And this cycle would repeat. And it got me to a point where I was writing everything down. I was still tripping. I was already writing down. You know, uh, I still couldn't see the screen well. Things were shifting out of focus. And I, and I was writing everything down, trying to, to capture that, uh, that elusive fish, those minnows that go through, through your net. But very, very important minnows. And uh, after two years, uh, it has stayed. It, now it stays with me. And not only that, uh, I, I can catch it now on the net, completely sober, if I take a nap in the afternoon. It doesn't work at night. It doesn't work when you wake up in the morning because at night you're tired and when you wake up in the morning you're fresh and you need to go to work or in your activities. So it doesn't work. But an afternoon nap on a Sunday when the weather is fine, you're in a good state of mind, nothing's pressing on you, you don't have immediate concerns, you don't have anxieties, everything seems to be okay. And you take that afternoon nap, I can catch it now. Uh, because I sort of, I, I smooth the path, uh, if you know what I mean. I sort of, I explored the space frequently enough that I can recognize it. No. And that gives you uh, reinforcement. So I no longer fall for the story of, uh, well, only now what I, know, what I know now is what is reliable because after that, no, I was drugged. <laughs> I was on drugs. How can I believe? How can I rely right. on what I thought then? I was on drugs. I, I, I don't have that problem anymore. I know I'm on drugs right now. It's called serotonin. Uh, drugs mediate our, our, our thought processes. Psychedelics are not. And by the way, there is then DMT, <laughs> the most powerful psychedelic known. It's, it, it's in, a, in the human body. It's um, it naturally. It occurs naturally in the human body. It's probably, I think there is a, late, a very recent result. It is manufactured by the human body. It doesn't come only from, from diet. Mm. So our physiology manufactures it. So these are neurotransmitter replacements. Effectively, they are neurotransmitters. And thought is mediated by neurotransmitters right now. 
if, if there weren't drugs in my brain right now, <laughs> I wouldn't be thinking. So I, I, I'm talking around it because there is no other way to talk about it, if you know what I mean. I can only talk around it. And, but the, the conclusion is I am at a point now where I no longer dismiss it. Uh, uh, through insistence um, and uh, um, skepticism about my own conclusion. So I was skeptical of my conclusion of saying, well, I can only rely on what I think now, not what I thought then because I was on drugs. I started questioning that too. Mm -hmm. So if you start questioning everything, everything, it becomes a recursive process. First you think, well, I'll go nuts because there's nothing I can trust, but eventually it sort of settles down, not because of an exercise of logic, it's like something within you matures. There is a foundation that underlines your, your rational processes uh, and that um, organizes um, your impetus. So uh, do, do you, ha, I'm sure that you've seen, though, people who are psychedelic enthusiasts that really do seem to lose it, that seems to be a phenomenon that happens. Yeah, yeah. And but by the way, I don't think psychedelics are a panacea. Um, I think one has to be very skeptical of what people call psychedelic noses because people come back from trips thinking, oh, the world will end in 2053 mm -hmm. and you know, aliens from the Pleiades have talked to me and have told me the truth. I think one has to be very skeptical uh, and careful about that. Um, the content of a, the psychedelic trip is not reliable. Uh, I have this theory that uh, the prime directive of mind is to deceive itself. <laughs> it is what mind does. <laughs> now, it, it, is, it, it is the foundational activity of mind is to tirelessly attempt to deceive itself. It's what it does. No, it's it's the, the metaphysical property of mind. It's inherent, <laughs> innate. Um, so in a psychedelic trip, that's what mind is doing. It's trying to find every possible way to deceive itself because that's what creates reality. Self-deception is the engine of reality. If there were none, poof, this would all disappear. <laughs> um, I, I, don't ask me to logically explain this. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I'm just sharing with you yeah. the things that I think but can't defend, can't argue. So, yeah. so my only experience with mind-altering drugs is marijuana. And I have, because I also have a skeptical disposition, I had this long thing, this back and forth. Can I trust myself on marijuana? And then I, I would think, well, I mean, I seem like I'm pretty trustworthy. And I'd go, well, you only feel that way because you're on drugs. And I'd be like, yeah, oh, you no. get into this dialogue. And, yeah. Exactly. And I, I actually had some, some interesting insights uh, in this, these just basic altered states where I would test myself and I'd go, okay, well, if I, could, if I could find something that I believed to be true in the altered state that I knew to be false in the unaltered state, then I could conclude you can't trust yourself in the altered state. And what I chose <laughs> was yeah. logic. Can there be a square circle? And I remember this pattern of reasoning because it was so unique. I was thinking, okay, can there be a square circle? And my usual state of mind was, no, absolutely not. These are two completely different things. And I remember hesitating when I was on marijuana. And I, then I started worrying. I was like, oh, crap, I went crazy. Like, <laughs> but what happened was I, I thought, okay, well, they, they are not identical things. But they're similar in 99% of ways. They're, they're both, like I drew it on a piece of paper. I was like, okay, well, it's a pencil drawing on the paper that has a particular shape that I wrote with a particular intention that are generally the same size. And yeah, I guess the shape is a little bit different, but really they're more similar than they are different. And I thought, uh, and, th and then I remember coming out of the state and thinking, oh, that's actually a pretty <laughs> good insight. That's correct. So but, I'll tell you, the, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm just, I had several phases. Yeah, so I, I get scared of thinking, well, what if I conclude the actual logical contradiction? Then I get out of the state and I go, okay, well, I thought there were logical contradictions. Therefore, you can't trust yourself in that state. Uh, now, the, 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 our normal frame of mind reasserts itself rather quickly. I, 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 48 hours is, is uh, <laughs> the number I usually come up with. So don't you worry. Unless you have a latent uh, psychosis, uh, uh, which <laughs> you may have. So one has to be careful because the ones who do have latent psychosis do not know that they do. Right. Um, and then a psychedelic trip can, can turn the latent into a factual reality. How can you prevent? Uh, do you know any way, any markers of that? Uh, uh, start with 
very low doses. Okay. Increase slowly. Uh, what would make sure that you like it doesn't go away after 48 hours type thing. No, no, no. Uh, 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 if you have a predisposition or a latent psychosis, a small doses will have uh, a spectacular effect, and and then you know because you know what the references are. An adult with 85 kilos, like I am, and six foot one, 85 kilos. Four or five dried grams of um, psilocybin mushrooms would be a fairly high dose. One gram dried psilocybin mushrooms should hardly have an effect. So if you start with 0.75 gram and you have a major trip, now you know. You know now, you have to be extra careful. Now, now, okay, so I don't know much about the details of this, and I'm sure actually my audience will appreciate this because I know there are a lot of psychedelic explorers um, that listen. So... Is the predisposition towards psychosis, is that just purely a sensitivity towards the drug? So like you could get the same effects with a smaller amount. And if that's the case, does that mean that the worry is people with psychosis will have brain damage because it's as if they took oh. you know, a, a bucket of psychedelics? Uh, well, I don't know. I am, I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. So the, the, the clean answer is I don't know. Um, my my philosophical view of what the psychosis means, it's just, it's not necessarily, uh, our minds are set up by certain cultural conventions to start from certain assumptions and think according to certain patterns. And somebody who is psychotic, so-called psychotic, is somebody who does not start from those assumptions mm -hmm. and who does not think according to those culturally accepted patterns. In other words, it's just a different person. Oh. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing unless it becomes uh, dysfunctional and, uh, and not conducive to, to life, which unfortunately often is the case, and then it should be treated as, as a condition that requires help, somebody who requires help. So you don't think they're actually going crazy. It's just something like their, their, their beliefs have fundamentally changed at such a level that they're going to be seen by people in normal culture as, as crazy, despite yeah. them not being crazy. How interesting. Yeah. And in other cultures, they would become shamans or healers. In our culture, we lock them up. Interesting. Um, but uh, so I, I'm not really a spokesperson for psychedelics because uh, I'm very cautious about that as I just try to illustrate. I, at the same time, I will not deny what they've done for me. Um, I, I hardly use them. I think last time I used them was years ago. Uh, but they've helped me a lot open up to spaces of thought, uh, spaces of insight is a better word, uh, that I, I, I didn't even suspect existed uh, before. Um, and what I wanted to get back to on that point of psychedelic trips being, uh, psychedelic no noses being so unreliable is the following. I think the message of a psychedelic trip is totally unreliable. Whatever the psychedelic told you is going on or has happened in history, you should take that with a whole bag of salt, with the ocean of salt. Uh, it is most likely not true because mind is always trying to deceive itself. That's my, my pet theory. Mm -hmm. But in the, process, pro, in the process of paying attention to how mind is trying to deceive itself, in other words, if you can split itself and observe all the ways, especially during a trip, because then it's amplified. And it's happening in normal life as well, but it's not amplified, so we miss it. But in a psychedelic trip, it's amplified. If you observe all the ways in which you're trying to deceive yourself, all the subtle techniques, and there are many, there are many. There is a technique of skepticism, I call it. It's when you're skeptical about point A. So if the trip told you A is true, and you go like, bullshit. I don't believe that. And then you fall on to B. And actually, the trip is trying to convince you about B. And A is, 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 a, is, a, is a, how to say, uh, there is a military term. It's a ruse. It's a, it's a deflection maneuver. It's to take your eye off the ball, if you know what I mean. And then you apply all of your skepticism toward, towards A, and you open up to B. 
and you fall back on B because I am a skeptical. So being B, but B is the deception. You know what I mean? So well, B, B is the deception, or B is what the, the B it, is the way mind is trying to deceive itself, and A is a is a distraction maneuver to take your eye off the ball. You're not you'll not be critical of B. You'll be critical of A. Right. Uh, there's a name for that. Uh, I'm missing. Well, so so go ahead. So what I'm trying to say is the following: if you pay attention to all these maneuvers. You can do that right now. It's much more difficult, uh, but you can do that right now. If you pay attention to all these self-deceiving maneuvers, at some point, you start realizing how logic is one of these maneuvers. Hmm. This is what I've been trying to convey to you for the past uh, half hour, and <laughs> so difficult, it took that long. So. The value of a psychedelic trip for me is not in the noses, is not in the A or B or C. I don't trust any of them. What it, what it gives me is it amplifies this process of self-deception self and speeds it up in a way like, a, like a, uh, when you speed up uh, the, the image of a, of a flower opening up. Mm -hmm. If you look at the flower in real time, you see nothing. But if you speed it up, you see it. So a psychedelic trip amplifies and speeds it up. So you see, you can catch it in the act. You can catch how your mind is deceiving itself in the act. And once you get used to it, it has unfathomable reach. It, it starts making you question the narrative you tell yourself right now. And eventually it gives you this, this Archimedean point outside logic because you've seen how your trust in logic evokes. You, you, you see that mechanism, you, you, you see it working. Uh, your commitment to logic, where does that come from? You mm. see the steps, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, they get blown up and amplified and sped up, so you see them moving. And you go, ah, gosh, that's how I am buying into logic. It doesn't mean that it's untrue. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, you see the mechanism behind mm -hmm. it. And once you see that mechanism, that's the Archimedean point that allows you to understand that when you frame the problem in a logical way, you are already buying into that mechanism. Mm. Uh, oh, so you're, the deception so you're already like, caught you. You're saying like mind itself is, is a deception? I'm saying that... So like there's, there's, there's the experience and the, the thinking thing that is experience is a deception yes <laughs> I wrote a book about that uh, <laughs> not meaning absurdity uh, um, well there's a sense uh, in which uh, I can I can more than allegory I, 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 like it is that it is a mental process which it seems to be like a progression of mental states but it mind creates experience by deceiving itself I cannot argue this according to the analytic school of philosophy I can argue this according to the Continental School, which I tried to do in more than allegory. It's a book overtly about religious myths, but it's actually about life, the universe, and everything. Uh, and in that book, I try to make the, more or less the case I try to make to you now, which is reality is created by an extraordinarily subtle process of self-deception. And when you catch it at work, which is easier with psychedelics, but you can catch it at work when you wake up from a nap in an afternoon, you, you see it, but you can't frame it because to frame it, I'm already buying into it. Now, but isn't there a sense in which there's got to be some type of a, a meta understanding at play here? Because even if you see the, the machinery involved and you go, ah, okay, this is the, this is the thinking thing that the mind, that, that consciousness yes. does, but you still understand that. So it's like even in the, the psychedelic state or coming out of the psychedelic state, you think, okay, I can't trust these experiences in a, mm. in a literal way, but doesn't that still imply there's still a kind of a meta-evaluation taking place? Yes, but it's not a meta-evaluation. It's a meta-observation or a meta-insight. Um, the moment you try to tell yourself what that is, you already put words in it, you already dressed it in logic, boom, you already got caught yeah. in, in the scheme. You already got caught in the deception. So is there a meta-process? Yes, there is a meta-process. But it's not a reasoning process. It's a process of observation. You see it. You just see it. You cannot tell yourself what it is that you are seeing. So this is this is so 
Awesome. Um, I, th- this kind of, I, I, I sense that there's something here, both just through the practice of philosophy. I've, I, I try to make a very rigorous philosophy, and in doing so, it's kind of destroyed a bunch of normal concepts that people have, and I'm, I, I see there's a lot of truth to be found here. But also in meditation, the, the, this whole phenomena of observing the mind acting is does weird things to you, and it's, and it's, it's it definitely gets down to the questions of what reality is. So I'm, I'm trying to understand. I don't, I don't quite have the insight that you have, so I'm trying to understand it. But is it something like, like what the mind fundamentally is, you could say it's, it's just a progression of experiences. And there are a types of experiences which are thinking experiences, and we label them in particular ways. And when you see the th- the thinking as just a progression of experiences, you you don't view them as I don't know. You, you view them more of it, more of it as like a game, like a linguistic game, rather than the underlying process, which is just the the experiences under unfolding. No, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, right. <laughs> th- think think of it this way. Imagine that experience starts from a sort of a, a little seed. And what will give substance to the experience is this process of self-deception. It's the narratives you you construct around that little seed. So you go from a little seed to boom, a whole world. The substantiality of the world arises from that self-deceptive process. That's what creates the substantiality, the palpability. At, at the, the birth point of all that, is a little seed that is infinitesimally small. It, it, it has no extension. It is so elusive as to be nothing. But that nothing is what gives rise to the everything. It's the starting point of that recursive process of self-deception that creates all the substantiality, creates space-time extension, creates the qualities as we seem to, to experience. But it all arises from <laughs> Imagine it as a golf ball that shrinks, 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 shrinks to a mustard seed, and it never stops shrinking. But it's not nothing, because it's what gives rise to everything. Can, but can if you remove the layers of self-deception, it's infinitesimally small. So everything arises from nothing. <laughs> uh, it's not logical, is it? <laughs> well, so so is there a state then that you can be in in which? You aren't doing the self-deceiving thing? I hear that there is. I tend to believe there is. I have never been in that state. Uh, the state I have been in enough times to to take that state as part of my life learnings is observing that process happen in which an infinitesimally little seed is blown up into the whole world through a recursive process of self-deception. So I have observed that process happen, but I've never been in a state in which that process was not happening, Hmm. if you know what I mean. I think the Buddhists call it the great void, uh, the, the state in which the process ceases. I've never been in that state, but I have, I have had the the privilege, the grace, as Christians would call it, the grace of seeing the process happen um, and catching it, catching that elusive thing happening. Uh, yeah, that I, I have had, uh, both in a trip and on the match. It's very elusive. It's like a fraction of a second. When you think, oh, I got one, gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's a wonderful note to end on. This has been an awesome conversation. I think I'm going to break this into two interviews. I think we'll do one on the dissertation, and then we talk for a while on the rationality <laughs> and psychedelics. I think I'm just going to make two uh, two episodes because that's that was just Sounds so good. good. I'm so curious about the, these things too. It's like I, the only thing I can relate to in this is I had a love experience that that really changed my life, and I realized, oh, this is this is essentially the meaning of life or the highest, I would say the highest state of human existence is the loving state. And I had this experience and I talk about it and I try to put it in context of rational philosophy. I don't think there's anything irrational about it, but when I'm talking to people who haven't had this experience, it's like, 
there is no way to understand what I'm talking about unless you've had the experience. And I remember this, I, I, th this sticks in my craw because when I was growing up, I grew up Christian evangelical and I used to have arguments with pastors and I really didn't like a lot of the things they were saying and I was doing the philosophy thing. And they would say, Steve, someday you're just gonna get it. You're gonna understand and you're just gonna get it. And I thought at the time, that's a cop out. And I was like, uh, forgive me as I'm not persuaded by saying, you know, I've had some experience that you haven't had, therefore I can't make arguments and like you just have to believe me or something. I just wasn't persuaded by that. But sure enough, they got the last laugh in the sense that I had the love experience and it, it resulted in some kind of a, I'm like building a theology and I, I think it, it greatly expanded my worldview. So though I haven't had your the thing you're talking about, I still, I have enough experience now to believe that in fact the experience can really uh, challenge some of those real fundamental metaphysical assumptions about reality. You see, I see today, uh, you're talking to a philosopher that identifies as an analytic philosopher trying to bridge the gap with continental philosophy, but I identify as analytic, um, who leaves out of reasoning. Um, I base nearly all my points on reasoning. Uh, but I see between, between you and me and all of your thousands of listeners, uh, I see reasoning as a straight jacket that I voluntarily put on because I think we can do a lot more with the straight jacket on than we are doing today. And once we do the best we can with the straight jacket on, then we can start talking about removing the straight jacket. But I think we are a couple of centuries away from, from that. This is how I see, I don't see myself as better. I, I think that a lot of people see it as I see, but it's not a cultural meme. Mm. It, it didn't acquire that, that collective momentum that many other bad narratives and stories have acquired. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 this doesn't make me unique. I think it's a shared experience, but it's not shared at a cultural level because it's very hard to put words on it and to communicate at a cultural level. We need words, we need memes, things that are easy to grasp. Mm. And this is not, this is the most elusive thing there is. So I think we are maybe two centuries uh, away from even starting to have the question posed, mm. if you know what I mean. Uh, but it is my daily life. Well, I appreciate you being so open to, and talking about it, because I know even when I had this less profound experience, it still can be awkward. You know, it, it's seen as, as uh, non-rational or something to talk about how your experiences of love, nonetheless, you know, changed your philosophy, much less talking about the experience of maybe non-logic. I mean, that's a whole other level of, like, bold proposition as somebody as a rationalist <laughs> to take. So thank you. You're welcome. It was uh, a lot of fun. Again. Yes, likewise. <laughs>